Hello and welcome to today's webinar. On behalf of Drug Target Review and DiscoverX, I'd like to thank you all for attending. I'm your moderator, Steve Bremer, editor of Drug Target Review. Today's speaker will be Dr. Andrew J. Brown, fellow at GlaxoSmithKline. Dr. Brown has been involved in drug discovery for more than 20 years and consults with the UK Home Office. Following his presentation, we will move on to a live question and answer session where you can pose questions to today's speaker. Please remember you can submit questions at any point during the webinar using the Ask a Question panel situated on the left-hand side of your screen. So without hesitation, I will pass over to today's keynote speaker, Dr. Andrew Brown. Okay, so uh, first of all, thank you very much to um, Drug Target Review and DiscoverX for arranging for this uh, seminar to take place. And I should say um, my apologies to anybody who was hoping um, that this was this was this webinar was originally scheduled about two weeks ago, but I'm afraid I was ill. And uh, had we gone ahead, you'd have listened to about an hour of me coughing and spluttering. So we felt it was best to postpone to today. So the subject of the talk today is this receptor MRGX2, which is expressed in mast cells and which we think is probably associated with drug-induced anaphylaxis. And the next couple of slides I've included basically to give you a little bit of autobiographical information, but also to set the scene for what we're going to be talking about today. So my background was all in uh, yeast genetics and molecular biology. And when I joined Glaxo, it was to, as part of an effort to express mammalian GPCRs in yeast. And this is possible because yeast have their own endogenous GPCRs, which are involved in the detection of pheromones. And that's shown on the left-hand side, side of this slide. And this took a couple of years, but was eventually successful. And we... Um, were able to access yeast strains which made uh, this possible um, at just at the time that the human genome sequence was beginning to be published. And yeast turned out to be a particularly powerful tool to study orphan receptors. Um, I've included a couple of those that we worked on in the middle. So we went on to work on um, numerous different receptors, which are listed over here on the right-hand side of the slide. And it was this background in GPCR biology which led to my getting involved in the activity on the next slide, which is around drug safety. So this slide shows a list of the what we call the secondary pharmacology panel. Um, now this is a set of proteins and targets uh, where we know that drug interaction would cause a physiological effect and in particular, an adverse effect. And so for any new drug or chemical compound that we hope may eventually be a drug, we proactively test in vitro whether that compound is going to interact with these targets and thereby try to make a prediction about whether that compound has the potential to cause an adverse effect. So there are roughly 40 molecular targets listed here, and that equates to about 55 different in vitro tests and that's because for some of these targets, such as the GABA-A ion channel, we need to know whether that is activated or blocked or potentiated. And so for some of these, um, for some of these proteins, they correspond to more than one in vitro test. So you can see that this panel involves about, about half of these targets are G-protein coupled receptors. And I should also mention in passing that the list includes the sort of the archetypal, prototypical, if you like, secondary pharmacology target, which is HERG. And this is an ion channel which is involved in cardiac action potential. And we know that blocking this uh, ion channel is associated with arrhythmia. Uh, I believe this was the first target that was required by regulatory authorities that needed to be tested for any new drug before submission. So what I'm going to talk about today is a G-protein coupled receptor, a GPCR. It's not one of the ones on this list, but rather it's a new, in inverted commas, GPCR. And I'm going to consider what might be the adverse effects caused by interacting with that receptor, and to ask the question of whether we ought to test new prospective drug molecules, 
at that target. So the receptor in question is a member of this family of eight uh, related genes. At least there are eight genes in human. The situation in rodents is a little bit different, as we'll see. Um, but we've just got to stick to talking about the human to start with. So um, these receptors, which can be uh, regarded as orphan receptors, if you like, um, they have some sequence similarity to a um, very famous orphan receptor known as MAS, and that's where their name comes from. So these are known as the MRGPR, and that stands for MAS-related G-protein coupled receptor. And so there are four, um, four receptors uh, numbered D, E, F, and G, and then there's MRGPRX, which is actually a, a subfamily of four different receptors, WOD2, 3, and 4. And you can see that the receptor that we're going to talk about most today is the X2. And um, the one other point I wanted to make on this slide was that this is the same nomenclature that you'll find if you go and look at the IUFAR database, uh, which is called the Guide to Pharmacology, a very, very useful database. Um, however, the, the nomenclature that's used here um, can get a bit complicated. Um, and so we'll talk about that a little bit more later. So I'm going to skip forward two slides. And just this slide is to summarize what we know already about this receptor. So MRGPRX2 is expressed in mast cells. It's a family A G protein, protein coupled receptor. It seems to have a quite narrow and specific expression in mast cells. And it's direct directly coupled to degranulation of mast cells. So if you activate X2, that directly leads to the release of histamine and whatever other inflammatory mediators are in those mast cell granules. So I hope we all know about antibody IgE mediated degranulation of mast cells. And this is classically what we think of as being the driver for allergy. So a uh, person who has an allergy to, for example, peanuts, what they actually have are circulating IgE antibodies that are reactive against peanut allergens. And so only in those individuals, peanut, peanut allergens will drive mast cell degranulation. And so this receptor, X2, effectively acts as a parallel me mechanism that can lead to mast cell degranulation and one that's independent of IgE, so it shows much less inter individual um, variation. And it's my premise, and you can see whether you agree with me by the time we get to the end of the talk, that um, when we, where we see unexpected, unintended anaphylaxis or histamine-like symptoms during toxicity testing of new drug agents, NCEs, this is commonly or likely be associated with activation of the X2 receptor. And certainly, if we observe those types of symptoms, then X2 should be the first thing that we investigate, either to implicate as a potential cause or to discount. So I said this was a new receptor, and I was being a bit flippant there, because of course we've known all GPCRs since the sequencing of the human genome, which is quite a few years ago now. So I think it's a reasonable question to ask, why has it taken so long to understand the biology of this receptor? And the answer is that it was really hugely difficult to identify the mouse equivalent of human X2. And therefore, we weren't able to apply mouse genetics, which we would commonly do to, to really get the, uh, the, the clinching piece of information um, that, that proves one thing is an orthologue to another. And the reason that it was difficult to identify the mouse equivalent is that instead of a single mouse gene with very high homology to human X2, which is what you normally expect, in fact, there are about a dozen or as many as 20 genes, all of which only have moderate sequence identity, enough sequence identity to place them in the MRG family, but not enough to have confidence that they correspond to a true orthologue. Now, happily, our understanding has moved on with the publication of this landmark paper from the group of um, Xin Zhong Dong working at Johns Hopkins. And this publication has really kick-started everything that we've done since. 
And the authors of this paper drew together three lines of evidence. And firstly was the observation that all of these many genes in mouse all sit at the same chromosomal locus, and it's the equivalent chromosomal locus to where the human X1234 genes are located. And of course, that immediately makes one suspect that one of those mouse genes could be the ortholog. Secondly, the authors of this paper systematically expressed the different mouse genes, and they showed that only one of those mouse homologous sequences um, conferred the ability to respond to the same ligands as human X2. And then thirdly, they looked again systematically across all of these different genes, and they showed that only one of those was actually expressed in a mast cell. So they had a pretty compelling story that one of those mast, uh, mouse genes, which was the gene they called B2, was orthologous to the human X2. And they didn't stop there. They actually deleted that gene in the mouse, and they showed that the swelling and edema and other anaphylactoid effects that you can drive with X2 agonists. And in this case, they used Icatibant, which is a peptide. It's a medicine which is used. Uh, it's an, actually an antagonist of bradykinin receptors, but it activates um, MRGX2. They showed that deleting the mouse gene prevented um, the effects of Icatibant. So putting this all together was a really compelling evidence that the mouse B2 gene was the orthologue of the human X2 gene. And this is a really important point because if you look at the literature, there's lots of references to the human X2 being primate specific or primate exclusive. And this paper basically showed that that was not correct. So, so far, all very interesting, but the proviso for us in interested in developing pharmaceutical agents is that we often observe anaphylactoid effects in species other than mouse. Uh, often that would be in a rat, dog, pig, non-human primate, and so on. Yeah. So we reasoned that if it was possible to find the ortholog in mouse, then it should be possible in rat and in any other mammal as well. So we adopted a bioinformatic approach, accessing public domain data on genome sequence and a suite of different tools. And the outcome of that is shown on the next slide, which was basically a series of predictions for orthologs in other species. And you probably are struggling to read what those species are, but they are pig, mini pig, two different dog, one um, beagle, one boxer, uh, rhesus, and the rat. So at this point, I want to say a quick uh, comment about the nomenclature of this family. I've already mentioned that the IUFAR nomenclature um, is, for the human gene anyway, MRGPRX2 and then for the mouse gene, MRGPRB2, which is fine as far as it goes, but we now have a large family of eight or seven or eight different genes, and it's going to become very cumbersome if we use a different name for each of those, where we, we are basically talking about the same receptor. So we've adopted a shorthand, which is that we call the receptor, irrespective of what species it's come from, MRGX2. And then where we need to be specific about the species, we define that with a prefix. So for example, the human, we would use little h, MRGX2, and, that, and then we're talking about the same gene as MRGPRX2, <coughs> and so on, little m for mouse. <coughs> Excuse me. So the way that we've um, gone about showing that these candidate orthologs um, are indeed likely to be the equivalent to the human X2 is to show that they respond to the same ligands so that I need to explain the test systems that we use to do that. <coughs> so basically we express MRG receptors in cells and we measure two things. The first is the binding or association between the receptor, which of course is in the membrane, and the intracellular adapter protein, which is beta arrestin, which you can see over here on the left of the slide. Actually, what we do is use a system where two separate halves of an enzyme are fused, one half to the receptor and one half to beta arrestin. And we measure enzyme activity, which is only reconstituted when a ligand comes along outside the cell and activates the receptor 
driving association between the receptor and the beta arrestin. The other way that we look at receptor activation is good old calcium signaling. <coughs> so the, the release of calcium from intracellular so stores. And what we actually do is load cells with a calcium sensitive dye and monitor that fluorescently. And again, we only see the release of calcium when a ligand activates the receptor from outside the cell. So in the last slide, I explained the general principles of how we examine receptor activation. And this slide shows the actual cellular systems that we use. On the left-hand side is the DiscoverX Path Hunter assay. And we've done a lot of this work actually in collaboration with the people at uh, DiscoverX. <coughs> so this is a CHO cell. And it's stably transfected with the fusions of both the receptor and the beta arrestin. And that allows us to measure the association of beta arrestin driven by agonist. But an important fact to remember is that the receptor here is perfectly functional. And if you activate it, you will also see an intracellular calcium release. So we can actually measure both calcium and beta arrestin in the same cell. In the rest of the slides, you can see the systems that we use internally at GSK. And they use either U2OS or HEC293 cells, which are immortalized human cell lines. And rather than using stable, stably transfected cells, we've generated bacular virus reagents um, for the receptor. Uh, we introduce those into the cells. In some cases, we also introduce a G-alpha-16 subunit, also using a bacular virus. And that, the reason we do that is because that can sometimes potentiate the calcium response. So all of these systems have their own benefits, advantages. Um, the DiscoverX, um, we like that because it gives you a degree of confidence looking at both readouts in the same cell. If you see both of those activated, you have confidence that what you're looking at is probably mediated by the receptor that's been introduced. The uh, consideration with the DiscoverX assay is that at present it's only available for the human receptor. So if we want to look at other orthologs, that's where we go to the U2OS. And we've built bacular virus reagents for all of the different candidate orthologs that I listed on the previous slide. So we use human as a control. <coughs> we've also introduced mouse, which is the same gene published by the Dong group. And then our predictions of rat, dog, mini pig, and rhesus, we've introduced into U2S cells. We've also used human MRGX1 rather than 2, which is the most closely related receptor which also allows us to look at specificity of some of the agonists. And then finally, I'm not going to present much data using the U2OS, uh, the HEC293 system, sorry, um, but that would be what we would likely go to if we were to do any compound screening. So in doing any of this work, it's important to understand whether the cells that you're using endogenously express the receptor that you're studying. And so here we've shown that the U2OS cells are a clean host for expressing MRGX receptors. <coughs> On the left-hand panel, you can see cells treated with a panel of ligands reported to activate either 1 or 2, X1 or X2. And you can see that in no case do you see any significant calcium response. In the middle panel, um, you can see the effect of histamine so there is an endogenously expressed histamine receptor in the U2OS cells, and that gives you a nice calcium response, which we've actually found to be quite a useful control. And there also seems to be a bradykinin receptor. So Lys BK is an agonist of bradykinin receptors, and that also gives you a calcium response in these U2OS cells. And then finally, on the right-hand side, it's also in important, if you're starting adding in additional G proteins, to make sure that those G proteins themselves don't start to confer responses to the ligands that you're interested in. And here we've shown that with uh, uh, X2 specific agonist, which is compound 4880. You don't see any calcium response to that if you just add G16. So the next slide is a summary of quite a lot of work. Several months' work, I should think, went into this. And this shows the effect, the, the results from adding in the um, ortholog X2 receptors. Now, remember, in each case, we're looking at calcium release up the y-axis. Um, the top 
left hand panel shows where we've added the human MRGX2 receptor and the ligand in all cases except one is compound 4880 and I'll say a little bit more about that on the next slide. As expected human MRGX responded and gave a calcium response to 4880. The middle top panel this is where we've introduced MRGX1, human MRGX1 and that receptor does not respond to 4880 but we've tested it with a peptide which is known to activate X1 which is called BAM 8 to 22 and there we see a nice calcium response. Then on the top right hand side this is where we've introduced the receptor that was published by Don, the mouse X2 receptor also known as B2. Again we see a response to compound 4880. Uh, and then the six Panels below are, are our own predictions of orthologs. The RAT, which is the middle left-hand panel, you can see a response to 4880. Now, the situation with, with RAT is more complicated than I've explained so far, because in the RAT, a little bit like mouse, there's been this, these replication events which have resulted in a large family of homologous genes, um, but where none are, 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 are sufficiently similar to be identifiable necessarily as um, the ortholog. So what we did here was to take the four strongest predictions of orthologs and express each one in turn and we found a little bit like the mouse that only one of those was able to respond to 4880 and that's the data set we're presenting here and that's the one that we suspect corresponds to the ortholog. And then we've got dog, boxer and beagle, mini pig, pig and rhesus and in each case the, uh, the gene prediction that was made gives a response to 4880. So we suspect that these are the real orthologs. I should also say that the situation with the other species uh, was much simpler in that there was a single unambiguous prediction for the ortholog. And in each case, we saw the 4880 response. So there's an important conclusion from this slide. And it sounds like a trivial one again but it is that MRGX2 is conserved across mammals. And I say it's important because, again, if you go to the literature, you will find many references that this gene is primate exclusive. And so this is something that we, we certainly do not agree with. So it's worth saying something about this compound 4880. <coughs> this is actually a polymer. Um, you can see the structure down here. It's got this phenolic unit with a side chain which exposes a secondary amine center. And you can see also here this is the data using the discover X assays for activation of human MRGX2 by 4880. Um, this is <coughs> a very interesting agent because this was used for many decades as the gold standard mast cell degranulating agent actually long before we understood that the degranulation was being mediated by the MRGX2 receptor. The other ligand that we have tested is cortistatin-14, and it is active in our assays, but we tend not to use it routinely due to cost primarily. So cortistatin is often regarded as the gold standard MRGX agonist, but it's a somatostatin ligand. Excuse me. It's a somatostatin ligand <coughs> and its potency at MRGX2 is about a thousand fold less than at somatostatin receptors. And as a result, you need to use vastly more to run an MRGX2 assay, and you end up using about a vial every experiment, which has a major cost implication. <coughs> Whereas compound 4880 is very cheap. So on the next three slides, I'm going to go through three examples of drugs that have been in development in GSK in the last half a dozen years. None of these are still being progressed, and all of their structures have been published uh, in the public domain, uh, although I'm not going to describe the structures or all of them within this talk. So for each of these examples, in vivo testing had thrown up unexpected histamine-like symptoms or anaphylaxis. And at the time those animal studies were being done, there was no known mechanistic cause. 
In the case of this example, <coughs> which is a peptide that we know is 448, and this is a peptide that was designed to be cell penetrant and inside the cells to disrupt a protein-protein interaction. Um, so this is peptide was shown using cell-based tests um, to be active at its intended target. So the next step was to do a study um, to understand whether it was stable in plasma in vivo. And so that study involved injecting a bolus dose into rat. <coughs> what was observed was an immediate anaphylaxis effect. And you can see the quotes from the study report. I've inserted that here. We came along later and showed using both Discoverex and our UTOS assays that this peptide activates MRGX2. And in particular, it seems to be a highly potent agonist of the rat receptor, which was interesting because, of course, that was the species where the symptoms were displayed. And we actually calculate that the concentration in the bolus dose was anything up to 10,000 fold over the PC50. So it's not really surprising that profound and rapid effects were observed. The next slide is a similar case study. But in this case, it was a small molecule and not a peptide. So this was a kinase inhibitor, 693C. And in this case, histamine-like symptoms had been observed in multiple different species, including rats and dog. And again, we came along later and showed that this compound, 693, activates MRGX2. I've not included the data, but we showed that it was active across the panel of species, which was consistent with the fact that symptoms have been observed in multiple different species. And the third case study, this is another small molecule compound, in this case an agonist of the motilin receptor. <coughs> and in this case toxicity tests had been carried out in multiple different species, but the only species where anaphylaxis was observed was in the dog. Of course, this is quite a challenge in toxicology where different species are observed in, uh, different symptoms are observed in different species because the question is always which species is most likely to translate to the clinical human situation. Here again, we came along later and showed that this molecule was an MRGX2 agonist. And again, it seemed to have much greater potency at dog receptor using the 4880 compound as a comparator relative to other species, and this might offer an explanation as, why, as to why the effects were observed in dog and not in other species. So I wanted to say a little bit about more about the mouse MRGX2 receptor, also known as B2. Now, if you go and look at the literature around this area, you may well find this publication, which came out a few months ago in a quite high profile journal. And to cut a long story short, the authors of this study were not able to generate a functional assay for the mouse B2 X2 receptor. Um, and in fact, they still were regarding this receptor as a primate exclusive gene. Um, now, that throws up the question of why it's been difficult to work with the mouse, um, whereas it seems reasonably trivial to build assays for the human receptor. And some of our observations may offer a perspective as to why that is. So the first data set on the left-hand side of this slide um, relates to the different behavior that we've observed of the mouse receptor, and actually the mouse and rat behave quite similarly in these respects. But this is data for the mouse receptor, um, and it seems to behave differently with respect to G-proteins. So the top left panel shows what happens when we introduce the human X2 receptor into U2OS cells. The open circles show just the receptor alone, and just the receptor is able to confer a response to 4880. 
But when we add the receptor and G-alpha-16, the response is potentiated by about a log unit. And this is normal behavior we would regard as normal behavior and, and what we would expect. And effectively, this is why we use G-alpha-16. But when we looked at the mouse, we saw something quite considerably different. The mouse receptor on its own supports a response to 4880. But when we also add uh, the G16, which is shown at the bottom in the filled squares, we seem to completely abolish the response. Or at least when we first conducted these experiments, we thought we were abolishing the response. <coughs> but when we looked back and, when, and, and repeated some of this work, we realized that there was still a concentration response curve in the presence of G-alpha-16, but the efficacy had been massively reduced. So that seems to be what the G-alpha-16 is doing. So this might mean that if the mouse MRGX2 gene is expressed in a cell type that has a different set of G-alpha subunits compared to the U2OS cells that we're using here, it might be difficult to show a functional response even if those cells work fine for the human X2 receptor. So the second effect of the mouse receptor, or the, I should say rodent MRGX receptors, is shown on the right-hand side. And here we're actually looking at the overall response to the endogenous histamine receptors in the U2OS cells, which is a really good control for whether the health of the cells is being affected. And you can see in the top right-hand side panel this is the effect of titrating in, well, I'm actually showing data here for the Beagle MRGX2 receptor, but you see effectively the same thing uh, for the human and if for any orthologue other than rodent. When we add up to 1% of the bacular virus for the dog receptor, we don't see any reduction in the histamine response, which tells us that the cells are happy. And in fact, these, these cells will also respond to 4880. I'm not showing that data. If you increase the quantity of the receptor transfected further, you do slightly reduce the histamine response with the highest quantity of receptor added, which is up to 10%. However, with the rodent receptors and the data at the bottom right-hand side, this is for the rat receptor, we see something different, and that is even with the very lowest amount of rat receptor tested here, we very significantly reduce the histamine response. And actually, if you look down a microscope, you can see that the cell health of, of, of these cells that have been transfected with the mouse receptor is being impacted. They look visibly different. And in fact, they don't give a response to 4880. And for the mouse and rat receptors, we've had to titrate the virus down far below the quantity that we would normally use. And that's because the rodent X2 receptors seem to be much more toxic to cells than the other orthologs. So it's probably a combination of these two uh, two different behaviors of the rodent receptors, the different behavior in context of G proteins and the toxicity, which may be the reasons why other authors have struggled to generate functional assays for the mouse receptor. So a really remarkable feature of MRGX2 is that it's activated by so many different peptides. And for this slide, we've tried to compile the activity data, agonist activity data, for all the peptides that have been published to have been tested at MRGX2, both the ones that were active and the ones that were inactive. And we've also included data for 19 peptides that we've tested ourselves using the DiscoverX assays. And that includes the 448 peptide that I mentioned had caused the anaphylaxis in rat. And the result is that we see a quite striking relationship, apparently, between the potency at MRGX2 and simply the net charge on that um, peptide. And in fact, every single peptide that's been published or which we've tested that has a net charge of three or greater, plus three or greater, in other words, is quite highly basic, has some detectable activity at MRGX2. And this is now true for nearly 50 peptides in the set that we've tested. It will be very interesting to go on and test larger sets of peptides to examine how far this relationship actually holds. And one of the sets of peptides that we've tested 
is this thing that's called TAT, TAT peptide. TAT peptide is a fragment of the HIV virus TAT protein, and it's been shown to drive, it has the intrinsic property that it will drive cellular uptake. Um, and it's the sort of progenitor peptide of a whole field now of cell penetrant peptides, which have started to be used as um, by attaching them to other cargoes, and that allows that cargo to be cell penetrant also. So we've shown that the TAP peptide is active at MRGX2. It's an agonist, and the data from the DiscoverX assays are shown here. <coughs> the um, reference that I've put in here at the bottom of the slide is also quite important. So this describes a study that was done to examine the sequence characteristics of the TAP peptide that were actually required for cell penetrance. And the result was that there wasn't much sequence specificity at all other than just charge. So multiply positively charged peptides seem to drive cell penetration. And of course, that reference comes from 20 years ago. There's been a great deal of work in this field since. Um, there are quite a few recent reviews that describe all of the different cell penetrating peptides and something like 95% of them there's no particular sequence similarity across that set of cell penetrating peptides apart from the fact that almost all of them are highly positively charged, highly basic. The one other peptide amongst that set that I'll mention specifically is this one. And this also comes from the field of cell penetrating peptides. And it's quite simply a string of nine arginine residues stuck together. So a peptide that really has no sequence features at all. And would you believe this is one of the most potent agonists of MRGX2 that we've yet found. In fact, its potency is similar to that of cortistatin-14, at least in the calcium assay, which is regarded as the um, prototypical agonist of this receptor. So this seems to suggest to us that activation is not strictly a sequence-specific event, but may happen to some extent at least with any highly basic peptide. So that leads us to start to speculate about what might be the function of MRGX2. <coughs> now I've mentioned today already that MRGX shares ligands in common with at least four other GPCR peptide signaling systems. I've mentioned somatostatin. There are also opioid peptides, endorphins, which have activity as agonists of X2. Uh, substance P, which of course is usually regarded as a neurokinin receptor agonist, also has activity as an agonist of X2. And then finally, agonists of VIP and PACAP peptides that would normally be regarded as agonists of VIP and PACAP receptors also cross over and have activity at the MRGX2 receptor. And it's possible that any one of those could be the physiologically relevant, bona fide, if you like, endogenous agonist of MRGX2. But a further possibility that we certainly need to consider is that MRGX2 functions in a similar way to another receptor and that's the FPR, FPR1 receptor. So FPR stands for the formal peptide receptor, and you can see it, um, the comic about it on the left-hand side of this slide. Now, its function, it's expressed by immune cells, especially neutrophils, monocytes, and macrophages. And its function is to sense um, patterns, features of peptides that are specific to bacterial proteins. It doesn't particularly respond to the sequence of the proteins, but rather um, is activated by the N-terminal formal group, which is a specific feature to bacteria. And it, when activated, it drives an immune response. In the case of FPR1, for example, neutrophil chemotaxis, IL-8 release, and oxidative burst. So we would speculate, by analogy, Perhaps MRGX is functioning in a similar way and detecting patterns that tend to be displayed by invading microbes, such as the HIV TAP protein, and thereby triggers an immune response in the locality of those microbes. In this case, of course, presumably mediated by mast cells. <coughs> 
and perhaps this relates to the uh, to being being able to detect peptides with cell penetrating activity, which is presumably detrimental to the organism. So I've got one more example of a novel MRGX2 ligand that I'll share with you today, and that's the antibiotic. It's a glycopeptide, it's vancomycin. So vancomycin has been used for many decades in, in clinical settings, and it's been known for at least 30 years to cause a characteristic set of side effects in man, which are known as red man syndrome. And this is an archetypal anaphylactoid-like response which involves redness, rash, itching, and sometimes also headache, fever. Uh, we've shown, using both the DiscoverX and the U2OS cell assays, that vancomycin is an agonist at MRGX2. It is very weak as an agonist. But the important thing to consider is that when vancomycin is used in the clinic, it's dosed intravenously and it gets up to extremely high levels in plasma, um, unbound levels of anything up to 30 to 50 micromolar, which would be sufficient to give activation of the receptor based on that concentration response curve. And therefore, MRGX2 agonism is a possible mechanistic cause of vancomycin-induced red man syndrome. And the reference at the bottom, actually, after we'd done these experiments, a paper came out from the Lerner group um, with basically also showing that vancomycin activated X2. And this paper was very interesting because they actually have an antagonist of MRGX2, and they showed that that antagonist blocks the effect of vancomycin uh, at the receptor. So we've done alongside the experiments that have shown that this receptor is very promiscuous towards peptides we've done some parallel work screening small sets of drug-like compounds and we've shown that um, similar to the story with peptides uh, the receptor is very promiscuous uh, very frequently activated by drug-like compounds and predominantly by basic compounds so bringing us back to where we started based on the adverse effects that we believe agonism of MRGX can induce, combined with the high frequency with which we encounter MRGX to agonism due to the apparent promiscuous nature of this receptor, we've now added this target to our secondary pharmacology panel. Uh, I think it's actually been deleted off this slide when I transverted it, but oh no, there it is, in the middle of the GPCRs, MRGX2. And so we now routinely test um, against this whole panel, which includes MRGX2, all of the compounds which are coming out of screening and prospectively going into clinical development. So finally, a few take-home messages. MRGX2 is a GPCR expressed quite specifically on mast cells, present in all mammals. It is coupled to the degranulation of the mast cell and that depends on release of intracellular calcium. It's very promiscuously activated, and commonly by basic peptides and pe uh, basic compounds. It is the cause of various symptoms in vivo, um, which can all be related to histamine release, um, such as skin reddening, swelling, injection site reactions, anaphylactoid effects, and, and they differ according to species and route of administration. And by analogy to FPR1, there may be no endogenous MRGX2 ligand. Uh, we may be uh, best regarding this receptor as a sentinel, recognizing patterns on pathogenic microbes. Oops. So finally, I wanted to run through my acknowledgement slide. Um, there have been quite a long list of people that have been involved in this work. I want to specifically mention Jack Grimes and Safner, who were involved in the, all of the U2OS work that was done within Stevenage. Rita Moita Santos, who was the person who did all of the bioinformatics, which identified the orthologs. Uh, and Neil, Neil Charter, especially, and his colleagues at DiscoverX, who did a lot of the testing of peptides and several of the compounds as well, which you saw.
Um, and we've been working closely with um, people that are much more expert in the field of immunotoxicology than, than I am, and those are listed at the top. And finally, thank you very much for listening today. Uh, I think we should have about 15 minutes um, to answer some of the questions, so I'll, I'll hand back to um, the moderator. Thank you, Andrew, for that excellent presentation. Uh, we now have the pleasure to introduce our Q&A session, where today's speaker will answer all your questions. Don't forget, you can still submit your questions using the Ask a Question panel situated on the left-hand side of your screen. Right, let's take a look at the first question. So, Andrew, why do you use U2OS cells as a host for expression of MRGX2 receptors? Uh, okay, so that's yeah, very fair question. So that's not the only host we use. We do also use the hex cells, um, but the uh, U2OS cells seem to have served us pretty well. We've got a lot of experience using the U2OS with the um, for flipper calcium assays. So it's a highly adherent cell line, which um, is uh, uh, what you really want to do those calcium flipper assays. Uh, it also has generally very low endogenous expression of GPCRs. I mean, we first started using those cells when we were looking at um, purinergic receptors. Purinergic receptors tend to be expressed by many of the immortalized cells commonly used, hex and chose and so on. But U2OSs were clean for those, and that was when we started using them for flipper assays, and we've just carried on doing it, really. They're very readily transfected with the bacular virus reagents, and it turned out, we didn't know when we embarked on this work, of course, but it turned out that they didn't have any endogenous expression of the X2 receptor. It's perhaps not surprising given that X2 has such a narrow expression profile in mast cells, but uh, nonetheless, that was an important uh, factor in, in, in choosing those cells to go ahead with. The other thing in retrospect, and again, this is something we didn't know uh, when we embarked on the work, and I guess we got lucky, where we've tried to introduce the um, rodent receptors into HEC293 cells, uh, even where we're using a cell line which works perfectly well for the human receptor, we've struggled to generate functional responses for the mouse, for the rodent uh, receptors, both the mouse and the rat. Uh, and we don't particularly understand why that is with, with HEC293s, but we've now reverted only to using U2OS cells for all of the ortholog work. Okay, great, thank you. Moving on to the next question. Um, why do receptors require co-transfection with GALFA-16? Uh, well, um, they don't always. Many, uh, and of course, co-transfection, as I mentioned, with the rodent receptors, that was detrimental to the response. Um, but uh, it's advantageous because it potentiates the response, uh, and that means that you've got a much wider spectrum, much wider concentration range across which you can uh, you can detect activation. And also, I don't know if you noticed for some of those 4880 curves, the top of the curve was not at all well defined in the absence of GL16. Whereas, because you've potentiated for GL16, you can define much better the uh, upper asymptote, and that means you're getting a much better estimation of what the PC50 is. So it's probably possible to work on these receptors without using GL16, but um, in some cases it's definitely preferable to have it in there. Okay, thank you. Next question. What affinity for the receptor do you think is required for an allergic reaction? Is 150 micromole sufficient? Uh, 150 micromole. Um, so, in the case of uh, vancomycin, I'm trying to remember what the actual potency that was, but um, probably I would probably say not 150 micromolar um, would be an extremely high concentration of any drug to be uh, to be present uh, in a, in an in vivo situation. Um, 
this question about what activity and and we should we should we should specify clarify that we're not measuring the affinity of any of these agents for the receptor in any of the assays that we've run we're measuring the potency uh, in 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 agonist functional assays so the affinity might be quite different but it's the agonist potency um, which we believe to be relevant and um, where we've um, tried to relate the concentration um, that that was present in the in vivo studies which uh, had, had caused the anaphylactic effects and the histamine like symptoms um, that does seem to equate to the concentration response curves that we've observed in the in vitro assays at least to some extent so if we're seeing uh, only an EC10 effect at a particular concentration in our in vitro concent concentration response curves um, that it would be unlikely, we would regard that as unlikely to cause uh, an effect in vivo. Whereas if we go to EC50 or EC80, at those equivalent um, histamine-like symptoms have been have started to be observed. Okay, thanks. Moving on, here's another one. What are the symptoms of anaphylaxis in different species? Uh, okay. Um, Yes, so I was I almost put a slide on covering this one, but uh, so there are there are there are certain common features. So the the redness uh, and swelling is uh, consistently observed across multiple different species, and probably also in man. If you think about the red man syndrome and the um, injection site reactions, which are observed uh, with uh, many of the the uh, injectable peptides that were described in the Dong paper. Um, but there are differences as well. So in some species, uh, there's, a, for example, a reduction in temperature. In the dog, classically, there's emesis, uh, which is not common to other species. Uh, so there are there are common features of the sets of symptoms that you observe, and there are clear species differences. And those species differences will be quite familiar to um, the, the, the people that run these animal studies. They're, they're so characteristic in the case of dog that when they observe them, they'll actually co-administer um, relief medications of antihistamines. Um, and the one other thing to say, of course, is that what, if you know that you're dealing with a, th this type of response, it's possible to just directly measure the histamine in plasma which might be something that's not automatically done in all animal studies, but where you're looking at an agent which is uh, uh, suspected to activate this receptor and, and potentially to cause these types of uh, pseudo-allergic response, uh, you can simply directly test for the histamine. And, and very often with these agents, you do see a very substantial increase in plasma histamine levels. Okay, thank you. Next question. What MRGX2 selectivity ratio, presumably Cmax, would GSK recommend for a successful oral drug? Um, I assume that's the ratio to the primary target. Um, we have oh no oh, to Cmax. So as I was mentioning earlier, we've tried to relate the Cmax from studies where allergic effects have been observed to the PEC50 and that it, it, it seems to um, to correlate reasonably well in the in the very limited data set that we've got so far available. So where we see an EC50, uh, if the Cmax is at the EC50 or greater, um, then we would suspect that there would be uh, a chance of having aller an allergic reaction. Um, it's quite difficult to define a uh, a, a ratio because um, this is not a side effect which is is, is necessarily life-threatening um, it will be very challenging to take a molecule forward for some indications that causes these types of allergic reaction but for other indications it will be uh, regarded as uh, as tolerable so it's quite a different situation compared to some of those other targets in the secondary pharmacology panel uh, such as HERG, where, is, where you would be struggling in, in any situation to take a drug forward towards uh, the regulators. Uh, in this case, we know that there are many medications which are agonists of X2 and are causing allergic reactions, but they are in clinical use, uh, such as vancomycin. Uh, 
Um, uh, so you would have to say that it's uh, it's a case by case consideration. All right, thanks, Andrew. Here's another one for you. How well do in vitro assays translate to in vivo effects? Uh, yeah, I think I'll. Uh, I think I've already answered that one in the previous couple of questions. So. Okay, we'll move on to the next one then. Why have some authors been unable to replicate the finding that mouse MRGB2 responds to gold standard MRGX2 ligands? Yeah, so I, I mentioned that in the slide. I mean, our suspicion is that um, because mouse receptor is toxic, um, if you use some approaches to generate a function, to, to, to construct a functional assay, um, they will they will not work, and they won't work specifically for the mouse receptor. So just because you've built a, a certain type of assay, um, whatever that might be, functional agonist assay for the human receptor, human X2 receptor, it doesn't necessarily hold that the same approach is going to work for the B2, um, and that's that's been the finding of, of of our work. It's been much more tricky to generate assays for the rodent receptors than for all of the other orthologs, human or dog or pig or so on. Okay, thanks. Here's the next one. What has happened in the rodent chromosomal locus? Okay, I can see you've got uh, the next question on down is is somewhat similar. Why are the rat and mouse orthologs so divergent? So I think the best the best explanation that I've come across is that there's been uh, there have been retrotransposon translocation events frequently happening within this locus, this chromosomal locus, um, and the effect of those has been to duplicate the sequence and also to drive a divergence substantially away from the sequence that there is present in human. But the fact that those receptors, which are so weakly conserved uh, at the level of sequence, are actually quite strongly conserved at the level of their pharmacological profile. So we've listed quite a lot of ligands now today, which have common activity between the B2 mouse receptor and the X2 human receptor. Um, there seems to be quite strong selective pressure maintaining that pharmacological activity profile, and also the expression profile. So notwithstanding there's been very frequent transposon insertional mutagenesis within this locus, the expression profile of this re particular receptor, one of the many homologous genes within this, um, within this locus in the mouse, one of them is specifically uh, consistently expressed in the, in the mast cell. Um, so uh, that seems to be the process that's happened um, and specifically within the rodent lineage, lineage. And that is supported, if you look at the rat uh, structure, of the rat locus as well, something similar has happened, but uh, it's not the same process. So there, there's the gene, the, the, the copy genes that are present in mouse are not uh, highly, highly related to the copy genes that are present in rat. So actually the level of sequence identity between the rat and the mouse is not especially high. It certainly wasn't enough to be able to define a single orthologue from the rat, and we still had to go through that process of expressing multiple different rat receptors uh, to find the one which was responsive to the 4880. Okay, thanks, Andrew. Just a couple more questions left. Um, what is the strategy for testing for MRGX2 agonism during drug development? Okay, so as I mentioned in the slide, we've added the MRGX2 receptor to our secondary pharmacology panel. So I said there was about 40. There's now 41 targets in that panel. And basically all compounds that are coming through um, early phase drug discovery, which is to say screening and in early phase lead optimization, um, are tested against this panel. And that's somewhere between 800 and 1,000 compounds every year. So it would not be practical to be able to test all of the different orthologs at that stage. So we just only we, we only test the human MRGX receptor um, within the context of that panel. But we do maintain as available assays 
um, to various different author locks. And basically where a program encounters an issue, either with just activity of the receptor, but actually more frequently it's where they've <coughs> moved in vivo and started to observe um, histamine-like symptoms, uh, they're retrospectively coming back and looking across a broad array of different orthologue species for activity. <coughs> Excuse me. Okay, thank you, uh, Andrew. Unfortunately, that's all we've got time for today. Um, any un unanswered questions remaining will be responded to via email. Uh, please join me in thanking Dr. Andrew Brown for his time today. And on behalf of Drug Target Review and Discover X, I'd like to thank you all for attending this webinar. As you exit, you will be asked to rate the webinar. Doing so will help us make our webinars even better. So thanks again for your attention, and we look forward to seeing you at our upcoming webinars. Thank you.